All right, guys, welcome. I'm glad that you're here. If you're someone who is seeking uncommon results, this podcast is for you. Success, happiness, and wisdom. What do these words mean to you? I think we can all agree that we'll probably all have slightly different definitions of each. In these podcasts, I get to dive deeply into conversations with some amazing innovators, influencers, and trendsetters that have had different versions of how they define the terms, yet have come out on the other side with amazing, uncommon results. At some point in their lives, they have decided to unshackle themselves from the norm and go beyond all boundaries. Well, hey, everybody. Um, tell you what, we're, I'm really excited to have uh, RJ Pino and Dave uh, Payerchin on the podcast today. These guys are just killing it and rocking it out of uh, Columbus, Ohio, in the real estate space. Um, primarily focused on single family homes and, and generating cash flow. And they're doing all types of awesome stuff. And um, uh, the little bit of I know from Dave, we got to meet in person what was a couple weeks ago. RJ, you and I have just had, you know, text correspondence, but um, these guys are a lot of fun and I'm, I'm looking forward to having you guys on the podcast. So thanks for being here, man. Grateful to be here, John. Thank you. Yes. So why don't you talk about kind of, you know, your guys' experience and the things that you have been doing um, in your real estate and, and other things throughout, you know, looking at, you know, what's happened with, with the COVID and just things and channels that you guys have been able to navigate through and kind of what's made you successful. Because I saw in one of your write-ups, you guys received a, a finance award for top 20 entrepreneurs for, surviving and maintaining or growing throughout the pandemic. So I think that'd be a lot of um, really great information to hear from what you guys are doing and just what people can do. Go ahead, RJ. Yeah, absolutely. So during the, uh, the pandemic, we had already made plans to um, take the business virtual. And, you know, we, we got into rental properties for uh, passive income and lifestyle and being free. And so, you know, when we got the office, um, while we were kind of creating our team and um, building our business, um, Dave and I were always asking ourselves, well, how can we do this anywhere in the world and not be so tied down in the business, you know, in, in a brick and mortar type office. And um, COVID came at the, the right time because we were already making that transition. Um, we had already started getting our, our uh, you know, property management software is web-based, our boots and the ground people um, were here in Columbus where we didn't have to uh, step foot in the homes anymore. Um, and then we found uh, other ways to uh, manage our team. Now we're on Zoom, everyone's on Zoom, but manage our team um, with checkpoints and, and checklists and stuff like that, more effective. Um, I, th I think right now, I mean, uh, the whole team, a lot of our team's virtual assistants, but um, for, for the team that's US based, they love it. They love working from home. We, we do our daily huddles. We still meet, um, you know, in the, in the mornings. And then we have our weekly KPI meetings. And we've had a very productive, um, you know, pandemic, I would say, or plandemic, whatever you want to call it. But, um, you know, we're thriving. And so a lot of it was having that mindset of being able to go virtual, but having those pieces in place to, to do it. And we just made the jump. And it just, the, the whole thing about the pandemic actually just, helped us move it uh, along faster, what you say, Dave. And that's, a, and that's a great segue into like what we do. You mentioned we do, you know, tend to focus on uh, single family homes. We do own some apartments and, uh, you know, we are a big believer and big supporter in any uh, cash flow stream that you can create and use leverage to create. Um, and we're big believers in real estate for just that. Um, but really with the pandemic, I mean, we're seeing more and more demand for single family houses. I mean, you got to think about it, John, you know, picture this. Uh, how many kids do you got, John? You got three. a couple, you got three kids. Yep. Can you imagine being a, a parent of three kids and you're cooped up in, in a stuffy apartment, your kids are getting homeschooled, you're now working from home, you and your spouse. So uh, the demand for apartments we are starting to see, and I think it's going to continue, I know it's going to continue, uh, the demand for apartment living we see declining and the demand for our asset class of choice, which is single family homes, is increasing especially with the interest rates as low as they are right now. You know, we do a lot of rent to own stuff, John. We do, um, we help people buy homes, um, you know, just traditional real estate. But, you know, we're, we're seeing more and more people who live in apartments saying, get me out of this stuffy apartment. Get me into one of your houses. Rents are actually going up in single family houses. Rents are going down in apartments. 
So it's uh, it's we're well positioned to uh, to take full advantage of everything that's going on along, you know, with this pandemic and whatnot. So with that in mind, with with you know, you guys have kind of was this the avatar or avenue that you guys have always wanted to go into or is it always kind of methodical of why you're doing the more of the buy and hold long term um and i know you guys do lots of different stuff but was that was that like a a purposeful decision that you guys kind of strategized or did it just kind of happen that way let me start this one rj so my i got my start back in 05 and rj started right about the same time he was in columbus ohio i was in phoenix arizona and I was driving around and wholesaling. Well, John, what was going on in the real estate market through the years of 05 through 07? It was booming. It was booming, and why? Interest rate, no. Well, I don't know, why was it? Because the financing was so loose. Yeah, right? the tie was lot, loose. Yeah, the liar loans, everything, yeah. Yeah, of yeah. course, yeah, because uh, anyone with a pulse can get a loan during those times, and that's what imploded the housing market as well, yeah. right? Because yeah. um, a lot of people- thinking, were, I was thinking like interest rate, but yeah, they were still they were still not that low at that time. They're but, in the fives, it's, yeah, it's, five, rel- it's <laughs> low, relatively speaking, but right. um, so basically, I got my start in real estate, and it was completely based off of speculation. I had no financial literacy growing up, never mm-hmm. really had a mentor. I was kind of when I was just getting started. Um, so everything I did was based off of speculation and I completely lost everything. In 07, I was bankrupt, belly up in the business. But, uh, you know, so at that time I uh, was licking my wounds and I knew I wanted to be in real estate, but not as a speculator, as a cash flow investor. And uh, I met RJ in about 2011 or 2012, but I had already known just from the losses and from the hits that I had taken previously in my career that I wanted to be a cash flow investor. What about you, RJ? What, what yeah, really turned it on for you? We, so I started, I started like what Dave did, flipping um, really good deals at that point in time where you can walk up and down the street and buy houses for, and, and we're in Columbus, Ohio, so different markets than, than uh, California or New York, but you could literally buy a house for 10K or rent it out for you know 750 bucks and uh, maybe put a little bit of fix up in it. And this is a time when REOs, uh, uh, bank owned properties were just abundant, you know, and you could just call the REO agent on the MLS, put in an offer, and then you have five or 10 rentals that week. That's how it was in Columbus. And I was selling to the guys, selling to those landlords who were picking up these properties. And what I noticed is that they, were actually living a happier life than me because I was always consistently on the grind. And I would, I would flip a property and then next thing you know, I'd wake up and do the same thing again. And yes, it, it, did, it was a good uh, business model, but it wasn't sustainable um, because you don't have that consistent monthly income coming in from, from rental properties. And um, I, had, I had flipped some rental properties to investors and I noticed that um, the business model that I had of just uh, finding fixer upper properties, um, the margins were really small. But if I flipped the ones that were rented, um, they were just, uh, it was off a cap rate. So it would like be three mm-hmm. times um, the wholesale uh, fee. Then it got me thinking, I'm like, okay, so why don't I buy some of these rentals? Because now I'm making a little bit more money, you know? Um, and how, how can I do that? So then I went down this road of finding out how to become a landlord and you know, um, going down the path of trying to raise some, some capital. And I, during that, during that time, um, I was using a software that, um, maybe some of your listeners know, but I think it's still in existence today was called freedom soft and Rob, owned by Rob Swanson, my partner in the debate, Mr. Rob Swanson, shout out to you, sir. <laughs> so, so I got that software, saw results, um, was invited to go to a, uh, seminar out in San Diego. And that's where I met Dave. And so Dave and I got to talking, he's an Ohio guy. And we were talking about, Hey, you know, the numbers in Ohio, this is kind of what I'm seeing. You know, you can get this amount of, of, of cash flow. These are the type of houses we can be in and out of them for uh, back then. It was like 30, 25 K it was like unbelievable. Right. And they were worth 80 or 90 K. And so we were like, okay, so we should do this. Right. So we kept in touch. And then in um, 2012, tail end of 2012, we made the decision to buy these instead of sell, you know, instead of uh, selling the them. Flipping stuff. And so we had, uh, the flipping business was already here and we just merged the two. Um, we raised capital through Dave's network 
and started buying up homes um, in the areas that we still buy homes today. So it was a different price point back then, but that was the biggest shift was um, seeing the opportunity and then putting it together. Um, that's where we formed a partnership and started buying rentals on tail end of 2012. Awesome. Dave, I want to bring back to something that you talked about, you know, um, through, you know, life experiences and, and the things that you were doing that you hit bankruptcy, right? And you were in the real estate space or going into that when you hit that bankruptcy. So what, coming out of that, what lessons or what things did you learn from the economic challenges that we had happened to us in 2008 to where you've kind of maybe repositioned or re-looked at things of how you're doing things now to prevent that? Easy. Uh, debt is not income. Okay, so, you know, I used to walk into Washington Mutual when that was still a bank and walk out with a $30,000 check that just slap a second mortgage on a house that I owned. And, you know, so that's just debt. It's not income. And I was borrowing my way to, you know, that, you know, to, that was my source of income. I was still wholesaling, but I was just levering myself up as high as I possibly could because I didn't know any better. I just thought things would keep going up. Right, it's just a very, very, uh, very, very poor fiscally management. Okay, so um, number one, debt is not income. Number two, um, fixed rate long term debt is your best friend in this business, not you know short term uh, adjustable rate funny loans. I had way too many funny loans going on right now, and or I'm sorry, back then, and now right now we're taking full advantage of the artificially low interest rates. Um, and, and we're locking up as much long-term fixed rate debt as we possibly can. And we're not levering ourselves up <laughs> over hundred percent. In fact, uh, our average LTV is around 66% on the portfolio. It's a very healthy portfolio. And uh, I think, you know, we are much more conservative investors when it comes to debt, you know, and how to structure debt is a, is a big lesson that I've learned. Um, and then, you know, not buying for uh, speculation that things are going are to keep going up, but actually buying for cash flow, making mm -hmm. your buying decisions off what, um, you know, somebody's going to pay you to live in this property um, rather than what is this property going to be worth in a couple months because it's going to keep going up. Can I sell it for a profit? That's not a business plan. Hope is not a business plan, John. Right. I'm sure you uh, know that well. And I, and I think, you know, you, you hit on a couple of things that I wanted to kind of bring back to you. Um, one is, you know, with what I talk to, you know, my clients about and things like that, there's a huge difference between having debt and being in debt, right? And the two are very, very important to understand, right? To where you have a healthy portfolio now, you're understanding collateralization, you're understanding leverage, but you, you, you're not over, over leveraged, right? And that's huge. What's the right? point? Yeah. Exactly, right. And, and that's what happened, I think, a lot of, with a lot of people in, in, in 2008, right? And that's, what, yeah. uh, and that's what caused the you know, the collapse and just people to be in that, that position. So, and the other thing um, along the lines of the, the debt ratios and debt to income, but long-term values, right? And I think you and I actually, Dave, were texting about this one day. And I think what I was trying to communicate is that when we look at, when we buy an asset, whether it's real estate or whether it's a, a mutual fund or whatever it is, right? We're, we're typically trying to look at the rate of return on the investment, right? Sure. Or the appreciation value. But for me, I care more about what I can spend and what that's going to generate from a cash flow value versus what the asset value is. Sure. And so I, I love the idea of what you guys are doing in relation to, you know, taking these artificially low interest rate environments, locking that money up for yeah. as long as you can, basically when we factor in inflation and deductibility is free money, right? Exactly right. And, and tie that up and, and allow that OPM, other people's money to generate your cash flow and to, to build up your portfolio. It's pretty awesome. I think it's the greatest trade on the street right now, getting long-term low interest money. Um, and it's funny, we say artificially low interest rates, and I'll explain that for your listeners, because what, you know, that, that's kind of a tricky one, right? I don't know um, if people kind of get that, but low interest rates should be a reward for having a surplus of cash and being a fiscally healthy business, or in our case, country, which we're not though. GDP um, is, you know, basically, and GDP is another one of those fancy terms, you know, but let's keep it as simple as possible. We live in a country where we consume more than we produce. 
So therefore, we shouldn't be rewarded with these low interest rates. The only reason these low interest rates are so low is so it doesn't collapse the entire economy. Okay, so we're taking full advantage of it. Um, we're in a very fiscally poorly run uh, country. And um, I think, you know, for your listeners and RJ and I, like a great trade right now is locking up as much of that low interest long term money because they're printing so much money right now. Inflation's basically inevitable. And real estate's a great hedge against inflation. And uh, like you said, deductibility, once you figure, or, you know, once you calculate the deductibility, you know, deducting interest off your taxes, as well as, you know, the assets that you're purchasing using this debt, um, the inflation will send the prices up. Um, you know, it's basically free money. That's, that was a great point you made there, John. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about your guys's, um, I'm going to kind of go back now a little bit about just kind of your upbringing. And, you know, you guys have such a an awesome entrepreneurial mindset, right? And just kind of the things that you guys are doing as entrepreneurs. Did you did you grow up with parents that were entrepreneurs or is it just something that, you know, like was it always something that you wanted to be like, you knew you were going to be a business owner. You weren't necessarily sure of, you know, what that would look like, right? But you knew that, you know, I want to do something for myself. Is that always a trade or did you grow up with that or did you have influences on that or who helped you, um, you know, get to where you guys are today? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start here. So it was uh, um, growing up, um, we were raised to, you know, get really good grades and work really hard in school so that we can get a good job. And that was, that was prevalent through, you know, grade school. And that message was um, just, that's how my dad and my mom got to this country. And, and mm -hmm. this was the 70s. They uh, worked their asses off in, in, in school, got lucky enough to get a, a visa to come study here. And I was just lucky enough to be born here, you know? And mm -hmm. cause if not, it would have been really hard for me to get to from where I am. So I'm Filipino and my, my parents from the Philippines migrated here in the seventies and went to Ohio state. Um, and so we learned um, working hard in that work ethic from them. And then I saw in, in high school, um, my dad started to kind of venture off doing like just odd things like uh, get his realtor's license, um, go to these uh, presentations from Amway and get kind of <laughs> nice. marketing. And so I didn't understand it then. I, I just saw it and I'm like, huh, I wonder what that is, what that's all about. You know, and, um, it wasn't necessarily a job. It was like he, he was trying to uh, do extra side hustles to, uh, you know, help with uh, his main job. And so I saw that I didn't understand it. And then I, you know, still had that, um, you know, they, they pushed uh, us to get really good grades and p potentially get into uh, medical school and be a doctor, you know, mm -hmm. and that's, I think that's probably 90% of uh, Filipino families that come here and um, they get pushed to be in, uh, in the medical field. field. Yeah. Medical field. I was just lucky enough <clears throat> to pick up on sports and um, one of them was tennis and basketball. I was decent in basketball, but you know, I'm five, seven, I'm never going to dunk, whatever. I'm not spud web. So my dad uh, really pushed tennis and I got really good at that. And, um, you know, in high school, I went varsity and then got a scholarship to play in Youngstown state. And so I, that's where I was kind of on my own. I was, you know, figuring it out on my own. I had this free ride scholarship, but, um, I got into a sales job after, after college that sales job led me to be really successful in sales and uh, management. Um, and then it was, it was in my head, it was you got to climb the corporate ladder to get to these, mm -hmm. uh, you know, new levels of, um, you know, making a, a really solid income to get the things that you want in life, which led me to being, get, you know, turned down into a lot of uh, promotions. And that spurred me to kind of look elsewhere for answers um, and then the life-changing book, which probably most of you guys, I know Dave read the book, but it was Rich Dad, Poor Dad that yep. completely, um, you know, changed my mindset, made me more aware of owning a business, being an investor, an employee, that whole four quadrants just blew my mind away. And that led me to this entrepreneurial path. And, but I always had that in me, like, you know, there was something always extra that I wanted to, to to get into a better life. And I knew that it's just being a doctor wasn't the way there was a different way. So I was always searching and that led me to being an entrepreneur. 
So awesome. that's, that was my kind of like my upbringing, you know, that's how, you know, one book changed my life, led me on this journey, led me to real estate. I haven't looked back since that was several, several years ago. What about I got, I got something really special here for you for a first time, first special edition reveal for you guys, which okay. I'll be busting out here in a moment. But my, my story is short and sweet, you know, like uh, essentially big family, I'm the baby. So forced to like figure things out young on my own. And I had to figure things out with the gift of gab, you know, cause I didn't have the, uh, the, the wits. I mean, I was like decently smart. Like I was a very good test taker, you know but I was a class clown. I was voted class clown out of hundreds of people in, in school and just always mischievous. Um, and because I was allowed to, I was just pretty much allowed to do whatever I wanted growing up from the age of about eight. Um, I was forced to figure things out, but um, I was able to kind of like maneuver my way through life with uh, the silver tongue, you know, and just kind of always have money and always do things. But my first entrepreneurial venture, my very first portfolio, um, John, no, they're not adult magazines. Like I know <laughs> you probably think, come on, you know, get your head out of the gutter. And they are actually baseball cards or well, basketball cards. I... Um, began here you go. Uh, building a portfolio. I'm just going to share a few few notables with you. I have a whole box right here, you know, and this is like my first card collection. I got tons and tons of cards, but um, I was smart when I was a kid. I was a card trader. And uh, what I would do is save up money from shoveling driveways and raking leaves because I'm from Ohio. And then instead of going to buy packs of cards, I would just save up money and then pay a little bit more for one single card that I knew was a good one. So I have um, literally, you know, hundreds and hundreds of Michael Jordan cards. I mean, here's Grant Hill rookie card, another Grant Hill rookie card, Scottie Pippen rookie card, um, John Stockton rookie, you know, Larry Johnson rookies, Clyde Drexler rookies. Like I'm stacked with cards. I have a phenomenal card collection that I want to share with you. I got the whole original dream team, uh, Team USA set. I have over, you know, like I said, 100 Michael Jordan cards because uh, Shaq rookies. I got probably a dozen Shaq rookies. I got Ken Griffey Jr.'s rookie card. So that's what I did as a kid is like earn money by doing odd jobs and things like that and taking trash out for little old ladies, whatever I could do to get money. And then I would use that money to go buy a $30 card instead of $30 worth of packs that all turn into garbage, right? So I would save up for one specific card. And then these are the cards that I still have today and they're worth a lot more. It's a solid portfolio. Interesting stuff, you know? <laughs> have, you, have you done a uh, uh, evaluation of what the, what the probability of the cards are? I did currently year to date. I keep tabs on it every day. Um, it's worth 150 million right now. <laughs> do you have a, do you have a lockup in the safe? Yeah, <laughs> it's a, don't worry about it though. You know, I, mean, I keep that I keep that stuff personal. It's, it's, I mean, you, you know, I mean, it's I probably, you it's probably up today. Yeah. yeah, yeah, probably. And I can tell by the you know the shoebox that you have them in. <laughs> you're real, you're real valuable about the value of that, but that's awesome. I'm right? just kidding. No, it's like 148 million, but it's you know it's <laughs> getting there. It goes up a little bit every day. Well, yeah. with, with that, you should be able to just you know utilize that as collateral to go buy a bunch of properties, and you should be absolutely. Good. You know what? I thought about figuring out a way to buy these cards from like RJ, write a bill of sale, have my IRA buy them right? As if I'm buying them and then dish them out and sell them and see if I can put tax-free money in my self-directed IRA. I was going to ask Derek Long if tr baseball cards qualify for a self-directed IRA play. So I might, I might liquidate, I might liquidate some of them, but if I do, I want it to be in a tax favored environment for sure. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, on that note, Dave, let me ask you this. What you know, for the listeners, um, what would be one of the things that you would share that has been like really key to your guys' success? And then RJ, I want to ask you this too, but you know, as, as partners, right. And running a company together, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that you have to just make sure that you're on the same page and, and, and looking at the greater good, but what would be one thing that you guys, if you can nail it down with what has contributed to your success? I'll start. Uh, loyalty is number one. Whenever you're in any partnership or even a, a you know relationship, relationship with a spouse, relationship with a business, relationship with uh, with anything, 
there's always um, one, there's always thoughts that are going to creep up in your mind. Like, oh, I'm doing more than the other party. Like it's the obvious thing. Like it happens, you know? So you've got to be able to um, realize when those thoughts are coming in and just have a conversation. Um, but RJ and I, I mean, we, we survived, you know? Um, and a lot of it comes from trust and just do the right thing, you know, tell the, tell the truth, you know? And when you mess up, lick your wounds, but don't, you know, don't turn your back on your partner. We're in this thing together, you know, like, you know, sometimes uh, a mistake, mistakes happen a lot, you know, sometimes, you know, we'll buy a property or something. It doesn't happen really, you know, as much now, but in the, in the early days and whatnot, it's like, man, why did we buy this house? Why did we do this deal? Why did we say yes to this loan? You know, it's like, oh, I don't know. You know, like, so RJ and I have gotten pretty good about kind of talking things through. I'll let him touch more on that. Yeah. Talking things through communication is key. And when, when we can't decide on something, we're just going to say no to it. You know, there's mm -hmm. been several opportunities that have come across our plate and we know each other now and know um, the core values of it that it just doesn't uh, align. Number one, if it doesn't align, we're not going to do it. If it's, uh, if it's something just completely off the left field, we're not going to do it. And if, at the end of the day, if we're looking at an investment um, opportunity and we just don't see eye to eye on it, we're just going to say no. Um, so that's 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 been key for us. Communication's key. Being on the same page, um, touching base a lot. You know, uh, checking in with each other. You know, hey, you know, some, we had some tough conversations before. Like, hey, I didn't really think that um, was your uh, you were at your best self at that moment. What happened there? You know. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the type of questions that you got to ask your partner and we've asked each other that throughout the years and that's developed uh our partnership into a, a stronger place than uh, most partnerships because that is the hardest this is a uh, davism the hardest or maybe it is maybe it's not, not an easy it's not an easy relationship to be in a relationship with me, that's for sure <laughs> yeah as i was listening as a partnership right? go ahead say that again the hardest ship to sale is a partnership. Yep. So that's the truth. And I'll tell you what, I was listening to like, uh, I was listening to Eddie Vedder uh, on Sirius XM radio being interviewed. And I would, I've, I've also listened to Dave Matthews. I listen to Howard a lot and he's got really good interviews, you know, and he was interviewing Eddie Vedder and he was talking about, Eddie Vedder was talking about his, you know, relationship to uh, Johnny Ramone, you know, from the band, the Ramones, you know, mm -hmm. And he's like, man, it was like one of the best friendships. I got so much out of that. Like I missed the guy like hell, but like, it's one of the hardest friendships. Like, you know, it's just like, that's the real stuff though, John. That's the real visceral relationships. Not this like, you know, surface level stuff. RJ and I, we've been deep. We've been in the trenches together, you know? And then, you know, Dave Matthews says that about the same guy, uh, the, uh, you know, guy who played the saxophone and guy passed away. And he talks about it in the interview. He's like, man, the guy was one of my best friends of all time. But he's like, that guy pushed me, you know, he pushed me to be better. I am the Dave Matthews that I am because I've had these band members through the years of like, they just wouldn't let me quit. And I would say that about RJ. Like, I don't think, I know for a fact, there's opportunities and things in our life right now that I just probably wouldn't have explored or I just wouldn't have taken it to that level, you know, um, and I'm sure RJ can say the same. There's just different things that we've we've grown together. Uh, but but hanging in there is is the key. And a lot of it's that ego stuff, man. And especially like when a business is new and fresh and young, and you know everybody wants that instant success. And mm -hmm. if you can hang in there with somebody through the hard shit, right? Pardon my language. I don't know. It's PG-13 episode. You'll have to warn your listeners. Um, if you can hang in there on the hard stuff. Uh, really that you know anything's possible at that point there's the you know the early days are the hardest because of that ego you want instant success you don't want to admit failure you don't want to admit mistakes you know you might have these creeping up thoughts of i'm doing more or you know something like that so these are all conversations that need to take place and decisions that need to be made and um if you can do it as a unit uh, you're gonna, if you can survive that early stuff, you, you can really take things to the next level. Like it's very difficult to build a big portfolio and a big part, you know, like a big business, uh, on your own. It, it, one plus one could equal 11 with the right people. That's how mm -hmm. we've always thought 
one plus one does not equal two. One plus one could equal 11 if done correctly, authentically, and they keep the ego in check. You know, and, and I think you guys both said something, you know, with uh, RJ talking about communication, you mentioned earlier on kind of right at the beginning of the podcast, and I'm glad we kind of went here, but you talked about your daily huddles. Do you want to like elaborate on that kind of what you guys do to, to clarify that communication things that you're doing as running your virtual business and, and the things that, cause you have team members, you have all these different portfolios and you and Dave are going 120 miles an hour, probably in different directions. My guess is right. But how do you guys, and what is the focus of those huddles and what things are you making sure that you discuss on, on those huddles and how often do you have them? Yeah, it, it really um, just like a football team or a basketball team or any team related sports, um, when they get together with their coaches and their leaders and um, before they go out in the field and execute, that's really what it is. It, it gets everybody in the right mindset um, to execute the, you know, the initiatives that we have for whatever the day is, whatever the month is, um, the quarter. And we also like to have fun. And Dave definitely brings that into the mix um, to, to lighten it up because that's, that's what we're doing this for, you know, and, um, so it's a good dynamic of a little bit of seriousness on on my side, a little bit of fun on his side, and we kind of banner back and forth. But um, it creates uh, a, like a, an atmosphere where everybody wants to win, have fun, and hit their goals, make money, obviously. Mm -hmm. And um, it starts in the morning. You know, there's there's times where I can't make it right now because of the ba the baby's keeping me up. You know, um, and I gotta get my sleep where I can, but. It's, uh, it's necessary to also be in those meetings when we're talking about numbers and how, how healthy the company is, is moving, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so we started off in the morning and it's, it's great. The, the mm -hmm. team loves it. We never used to do it like that because it just used to be just Dave and I. Yeah. So we would touch base in the morning, but um, now we have a little bit more structure. Um, everyone likes it, especially if you have eight players on your team. Eight players need to have direction. They need to have targets, mm -hmm. you know? like Michael Jordan need to have, you know, a, a goal, right. To, mm -hmm. to be as great as he is or LeBron, you know, and um, I think uh, we've gotten a lot better with, with putting a players in the, in positions that they're in and, and we're seeing the results from that. It's a different, um, you know, I think our, our dynamic now is way different than it was two or even two years ago. Um, so the uh, that's, that's the importance of the daily huddle. Mm. Is to get everybody on the right mindset so that, that we can we can score. Let me let me touch on that. So RJ talks about like a players. That's another growth thing that we have encountered in our uh, business in our relationship is giving up a little bit of the pie. Like you know, I think newer businesses. Um, well, I mean, it's it's hard as hell to build a business. Number one, there's not a lot of the pie to go around. I mean, we've right. RJ and I have taken a lot of hits and we've had way high overhead and but we've just, just kept, keep rolling. We've seen made huge swings in our life, you know, six figure swings routinely, you know, like, um, and it gets you real calloused up. It gets you real money minded when you can experience great loss and, and, you know, the highs aren't that high anymore and the lows aren't that low when you could keep it level headed. Um, but we've learned to, to give, you know, to, to give some to the A players, let them be bought in, you know, and, uh, then they will do more. And I, I have to say, RJ certainly was faster and quicker to adopt that and, and help me along um, when it's like, look, man, let's give up a piece of the pie, right? And then we can actually focus on bigger things. Um, you know, like we, then we can actually free up time so we can do like five-star golden podcasts like the John Dwyer podcast. There's no way we would have the time for this unless we empowered our people. So right. RJ was quick on that one and a great story. And it's, it's a book in of itself. And in fact, this, this might be the next, you know, thing that I, I kind of teach on is, you know, RJ was the first to kind of get us out of the turnkey business, John. And we've never talked about this on a podcast before, but we used to be heavily into the turnkey real estate space where we would buy a home, fix it up, get it rented and then sell it and then retain the management, right? That was right. our business. And RJ was the one of, well, he was the first one in our business to, to say, you know, I think, you know, what's the point? Why don't we just manage our own stuff? Why are we selling all these golden geese? Why don't we just keep them all? And then like my immediate defense was like, well, we need to sell to keep the revenue going like that. We just had to think about it differently. 
So I needed that direction at that time, you know, because sometimes you don't know what you don't know and you can't see the forest through the trees, you know what I mean? So um, there's a lot of experiences that we've encountered where we've helped each other along and kind of see things a different way that have ultimately got us where we're at. I think, you know, when you look at the things that you're doing too, and I think, you know, the, the instant gratification or the, the revenue today, right? Sometimes right. we make decisions based on that. But yet when we look at investing or whatever we're doing, it's, it's really a long-term game, right? And I think that you made a good comment, Dave, just a few minutes ago too, about talking about the, the experiences and then what you guys are doing. And I think ego was one of them, right? That you mentioned, removing your ego from the picture. And we all have egos. Let's, let's, let's not kid ourselves. Everybody Without a doubt. Has. Everybody we're, we're fireballs. We're a bunch of bulls, right. you know? Right. Like, so everybody yeah. has an ego. And, but then the other thing though, is in what I thought was, was real strong. And what you said is that um, the, the timing of things, right? The, the, you don't become great or successful overnight. And I always talk about, there's no shortcut to greatness and you're going to experience, you know, ups, downs and lows, but the perseverance and then learning from those opportunities and allow you to, to readjust and reassess but continue the the forward progression, I think is huge. And I, you know, hearing what you guys are talking about, I think that's huge, especially in a time like where we're in today, there's so much uncertainty right now, right? With, with a lot of things that are going on. And if you can just, again, look at the overall goal in the, in the plan and, and just continue to, you know, move that progress forward. That's is what, that's, what's going to create you guys. If you continue even to be more and more successful as you guys work together. I think I'm bull. I'll tell you where I'm bullish. I'm bullish on what we both do. I know you're in the life insurance ish business. I won't speak for you, but that's a great play. And I like our, our play in the affordable housing. I mean, you know, affordable housing is getting gobbled up. We're becoming a nation of renters. This has been predicted long before COVID. The COVID right. just put it on steroids. I mean, houses are flying off the shelves in affordable markets. People are fleeing expensive markets you know, San Francisco, uh, New York, Manhattan, you know, the coasts, people are out of here. They're not paying the taxes. They're moving to tax favorable places, affordable right. living. They want a big house because everybody works at home now. Nobody wants his and her sinks in, in the bathroom anymore. Now it's his and her Zoom rooms. It's mean, <laughs> yeah. the truth, you know, and you're not going to get that in these high dollar, highly taxed places, you know, yeah. so there's definitely a shift coming, but I'm very bullish on our business here in Ohio. I mean, we're gobbling up houses in the suburbs, John. We're not touching anything downtown. I got a whole thesis on why downtown investing is out the window. And mm -hmm. long-term suburban and even rural is the way to go. People want space, people want land, especially when they're living at home, working at home, raising their kids and homeschooling. It's like, we need space. You're not going to get that from some ritzy downtown condo. Why would you even buy the ritzy downtown condo? You want to be close to amenities. The amenities are all closing up anyway. We're on a you know, big global pandemic going on. So nobody's doing anything. Um, and people want pets too. That's another part of that. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm very bullish moving forward on what we do and what you do. And we're looking forward to working with you as well. Yeah, man, that's awesome. Well, I really appreciate you guys being on. Um, if you could leave, if you could leave one golden nugget for the listeners of this podcast, um, what would it be? I got one for you. Okay. It's something that I'm writing down. It's a little bit of combination of what you just said, but um, we've invested a lot of our um, into our personal development, into business development and such. And, um, you know, we've invested well over a hundred thousand dollars, but to do that, you, you can, you can, you can cut, the learning curve by doing that, right? You can cut the learning curve, but you can't cut out the work. Mm -hmm. You can't cut out the work. It takes work to get to be successful. You can cut out the learning, right? The curve of learning, because you can yep. hire a mentor to gain the knowledge and that's useful. But in order to get to that next level, to get to that success, you got to put in the work. That's something that Dave and I have done. Um, we haven't, we haven't, uh, you know, um, cut out you know it, it's like it's like basically you you can you can get to the um book or knowledge by paying but if you're not going to put in the work to get right. you know to get the the you know the uh, to your end goal it's just you're not gonna you're not gonna see success it'll just be a dusty bookshelf you know what i mean so that's my that's my little advice 
and that came from you too. You were saying like, you know, with the ego and, um, you know, stuff that we've learned in, in our, in our past and our journey here is that, uh, you know, sometimes the ego gets in the way and you really get to let go of that. Um, so you can get to new levels. What do you think? Awesome. I think that's about it, man. I mean, that's about all I got as well. You know, it's, it's the same thing. Like, you know, you can't escape the grind is what we've been saying. Learn that from the great Jason Medley, one of the most influential people in our life, uh, founder of the Collective Genius Mastermind, who we've made so many great connections through that group. And uh, RJ is exactly right, man. I mean, you can, you can shorten the learning curve, but you can't shorten the work. No. Roll the sleeves up, get your ass out there and make something happen. Can't escape the grind. And, and invest in yourself. That's right. It, buddy. And, and I think, and I think that's what a lot of people, especially trying to be entrepreneurs, they, I think they missed that boat is they got to continue to invest in themselves. And again, it's not just, you know, you can shorten the learning curve, right? RJ, like what you're talking about it, but if you just, if you don't implement or execute, you've just pissed away all the, the value and knowledge that could have been there. Right. And again, it, it's the grind. It's not easy. Things aren't easy. Right. But if you invest in yourself and, 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 take advantage of opportunity and, and just take the blinders off, right? I talk about playing full out all the time, right? Don't sit on the lo- sidelines and let, let life happen to you. Get in there, man, and make life happen because of you, right? So, hey, man, I, I appreciate you guys being on here. And uh, Dave, you know, it, it's November 3rd, right? And Dave, Dave's got the flag on. So get out there and go vote. And uh, all right, baby. Uh, appreciate you guys being on. And uh, man, uh, just Again, thank you for your time and your knowledge and your wisdom that you guys share with everybody. I really appreciate it. Oh, and if they, people want to reach out to you or uh, get in hold of you guys, what where can they reach out to you or where can, where can they find you? Go to www.risewiththecream.com. You know what the cream is, John? I was going to ask that too. What? Yeah, because it's, it's right behind RJ's head, so I can't the cream see all is the cream cash flow, real estate, and money. That's where you're going to find us. Cash flow, real estate, and money is everything we talk about. You're going to learn everything that we do from raising private capital, how to acquire discounted properties, how to lever up appropriately, responsibly, um, how to build a portfolio, how to bring in cash flow streams, and uh, risewiththecream.com. Because, John, I'll let you finish this for me here. Uh, the cream always rises where? To the top. Hey, I got yeah, that one right, right. buddy. <laughs> Damn right. Rise also, with the cream.com, everybody. Yeah. Also, awesome. follow, follow us ahead. on social media. Um, so Dave's handle is at the real Dave P, and our and my handle is at RJ Pepino. And we put out um videos daily on anything related to uh money, cash flow, real estate, anything that is uh uh, about that and, and mindset too. There's some mindset stuff there. So if, if you're looking to get some t- tips or whatever, go, get onto uh, those platforms. It's Instagram um, at RJ Pepino and at the real Dave P and you can find us there as well. And it, it's great stuff, man. I, I enjoy your guys' Facebook posts and you know, you guys have a lot of fun with it and you also provide a lot of knowledge. So Keep up the yeah, awesome work. You better, I'm, I'm going to see a few more likes out of you, Dwyer. What I are you talking about? I like this stuff all the time. I'm riding everybody anymore. If I don't <laughs> see you liking my stuff, would you tell me you watch it? So, you're on my hit so, list. So is that like you're, are you, are you bribing my friendship? Is that what you're doing? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I need as much traction as I can get. My goodness. No, it was great right. to be here, man. Thank you very yeah, much I for having both of us. Good hanging. Awesome. Good hanging with you, John. Yeah, appreciate it. Awesome. All right. Thanks, guys.